Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us uh, for this high-level panel discussion. Uh, my name is Michael Haidu. Uh, I'm representing the organizers of this panel discussion, uh, which includes uh, my organization, CTA, Technical Center for Agricultural and Rural Cooperation, the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI, the ACP Secretariat, BMZ and GIZ, as well as the Pan-African Farmers Organization. The topic of our discussion this afternoon is promoting sustainable agriculture and trade for inclusive growth, addressing inequalities through private sector development and investment. Agriculture and trade offer tremendous opportunities for economic growth and job creation, particularly in Africa, where both sectors have a lot of scope for growth in the coming years. The rollout of the African Continental Free Trade Area, FCFTA, is expected to give rise to a combined market potential of $3.5 billion. By 2030, the African food and agriculture market is projected to increase to $1 trillion, opening up huge opportunities for income for smallholder farmers and others along the value chain, as well as create much-needed jobs for millions of young people. Whereas most of the growing demand for food could be filled through increased national and regional production in Africa, if the current trend of high <coughs> level of re re reliance on imported food continues, Africa's food import bill is projected to increase to $110 billion by 2025. With the 2014 Malabo Declaration for the Transformation of Agriculture, African heads of state have made a clear commitment to triple regional trade in agricultural products. Moreover, they have also committed to create jobs for at least 30% of the youth in the agricultural sector. Indeed, this is a strong policy commitment at the highest level to accelerate regional trade and promote sustainable agricultural transformation in Africa. <clears throat> but the challenge is how to make agricultural transformation and regional trade more inclusive and help address inequalities in the agri-food system. So our panel this afternoon will address some of these key issues and explore ways to tackle inequality and promote inclusive agriculture development and trade, including through smart policies and private sector investments, which benefit local communities and all actors along the agricultural value chain. So some of the key issues that we hope to discuss by the panel this afternoon include understanding the main drivers of inequality in the agri-food system, how to promote financial inclusion to benefit smallholder farmers, small and medium enterprise, and other, other value chain actors, the opportunity for Africa, inter-Africa trade to, pro, to promote greater inclusiveness and highlight a few, some of the good practices that we have, and finally, to come up with some concrete actions to address the most pressing inequalities in the value chain which could inform policy and practice. So before I introduce uh, our panel, our distinguished panel, I just want to remind you that uh, there is uh, interpretation in uh, French, uh, English, and uh, I think those are the two languages, and also of sign language. So uh, you can use uh, whatever language uh, suits you most. We also hope to have uh, brief interventions from the panel and really try to make this uh, quite an interactive discussion. So we very much look forward to questions from the audience. Also, uh, we encourage you to tweet your uh, observations, uh, you know, your ideas uh, using the uh, hashtag EDD2019. 
uh, and also uh, there is another tag as well that, that you could use. I think it's, it's up there. Uh, so l let me uh, quickly introduce our, our panel uh, members here. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Patrick Gomes, Secretary General of the ACP Group. Thank you. Uh, since 2015, uh, doc Dr. Gomes, before he became Secretary General of the ACP Group, he was Ambassador of Guyana to Belgium and the EU. He has published extensively on development and social policy issues. Uh, he has also been teaching at universities and also working for the UN in the past. So extensive experience in trade development policy issues. Nice to have you with us. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, next is uh, Leonard Mizi. Leonard is uh, head of unit for rural development, food security, nutrition in DG DEVCO, uh, European Commission, a position he had since 2017. Uh, previously, he has worked in DG Agri as well, working more interinstitutional uh, matters. And before he joined the commission, he has been working in the private sector in his uh, native country, Malta, uh, for, for several years. So he has a strong private sector perspective. We have uh, Isabel Durand. Isabel, uh, she's a Deputy Secretary General of UNCTAD since July 2017. Uh, Isabel had very senior responsibilities in her native Belgium. Uh, she's very well known, including uh, as a minister and as a senator, as well as she was the vice president of the European Parliament. So a lot of uh, policy experience. Uh, pleasure to have you with us. Ji Yong Heng, Ji is over Thanks. there, uh, who is a fund manager and principal at the TLG Capital with investment opportunities across TLG's private credit and equity funds, including managing trade finance and special situations business. He has been responsible for spearheading the launch of uh, trade and supply chain finance with focus on uh, small and medium enterprises and especially supporting Sub-Saharan Africa. Nice to have you with us, you. Uh, G. Moala Moto. He is one of the young entrepreneurs, EDD young leaders, well over there at the end. Uh, his company operates as a social enterprise uh, aimed at reforesting Zambia and addressing inequalities by empowering smallholder farmers, mostly women and youth. So working on climate, environment issues, as well as inequality issues. Uh, Maria. De Concepcion Blanco, Maria. She is the head of Sustainable Finance Solutions, BBVA Microfinance Foundation. Uh, for more than 25 years, Concepcion has worked in the banking and financial sector, mostly development of finance products in uh, different geographies. And finally, we have David Laborde, uh, his senior research fellow. Uh, in the Markets, Trade and Institutions Division of the International Food Policy Research Institute. His work is on, microeconomic, on macroeconomics and trade, and his research interest includes uh, globalization, international trade, measurement, and modeling uh, of protectionism. So he will give us you know, the research perspective uh, this afternoon. So welcome. So, without any further ado, I will uh, invite uh, Patrick Gomes to give us the setting, you know, in terms of okay. the trade issues. Well, you can do it from there, where you are. There is no problem. Maybe whatever, whatever yes. works for you. Yes. Uh, please, Secretary. Good. Well, thank you so much, Michael, and good afternoon to everyone. Happy to be here. I know at this time of the day, perhaps it's a little tiring after a good lunch. But uh, the ACP, African Caribbean Pacific Group, uh, is very happy to be associated with this panel. We consider it the most significant panel that you've had for the EDDAs. It's the most significant one. 
We know that the others are a bit jealous, those from Tradecom, they did good work. But I think why this is important is because agriculture itself is the core, the foundation in the developing world, in the South. And it has been, of course, in the developed world too. And that is why agriculture must play a more significant role in this century, not only for food, but to ensure that the livelihoods of people in the rural areas and rural communities are meaningful and realistic. If not, then we continue to have the problems of the drift from the rural areas to the urban areas. And some would say we have the drift of those who leave the south and come to the north, the migration issue, who move also within their own continent, Africa, etc. Now, when I look at the title, and I've been reminded by Iselina and the organizers, I must think twice. And in thinking twice, I was a bit struck that we're speaking about addressing the inequalities. Well, we want to address and overcome. We want to address and overcome. We want to address and have some line of action and activity that will overcome not only the inequalities, but the increasing, the desperately disturbing, tremendously disturbing inequalities occurring in the world today. We face a situation where less than 1% of the world control more than almost 50% of global wealth. It is a historical time in human societies, human sapiens, when we relate to our environment, where this concentration of the few to the top, it is not by accident that there is such a question of challenging elitism, but people are feeling the concentration of wealth too much at the top. And of course, we're very happy to know that numbers of people in developing countries have moved out of poverty and they have income increased in the last 10, 20, 30 years. China is a great example of that. But the deprivation, the distance between the two, in fact, the relative deprivation, is worse off now than 70 years ago. Because the real returns on the wages of people, and those we put in the category of the middle class, are not able to have the same value or purchasing power that they've had 20, 30 years ago. The concentration of the market system has become acutely an apex. And therefore, that is disturbing. That is why the inequalities have to be addressed. Now, the inequalities have to be addressed in a comprehensive way. For us in the African Caribbean Pacific group, this is a very serious matter. It is a complex matter. So we can't go about it in a simplistic way. And that is why in the program that we are negotiating now, with the European Union, we redesigned, let us say, the pillar. One pillar of trade, which was basically commodity tradings. You know, you buy the lovely cashew or the cocoa, and it comes up here, and the milk of Nestle gives you the best chocolate in the world. But the value of the, the cocoa best. is far less, and the value of the cocoa farmers who produce that is far less than what you get from Godiva, nicely packaged, or Mercolini, wherever. So the value addition that is derived from the basic production and commodity of those who are working there, in fact, is distorted. That is the fundamental basis. Our system of economic production and organizing production and organizing how the value of produce will serve the needs of persons have become distorted because it's capital and money and the value addition, and the end product, and the consumer, what you want, those who will afford the Godiva or the Marcolini will go after that, and we try. So therefore, we have said the value chain is the concept that must replace the commodity or the simple enterprise. And that means understanding from production, even before production, understanding what goes into making the production most effective in a particular circumstance of the type of soil, of the type of variety, etc. Production right across, the processing, and improving the processing methods. The chain must have the processing, and then the marketing. Coca-Cola does a great job in marketing its product. It's not good for your health, I keep hearing. I know it's not good for my teeth, too much of that sugar in the cocoa. So in addition to the marketing, then, is the consumer. And the consumer now is looking for much more for quality and health concerns. No, I did. So when we bring this concept of the chain, we must see it in that holistic way. And if we see it in that holistic way, we see it from production, 
right through marketing, consumption, and therefore consumption also relates to the health. That's why we see food production, food security, linked to nutrition and health factors. <clears throat> Where does the ACP come in? Now, my remarks are just trying to set the stage. Set the stage so we understand in a systemic way what we want to do about increasing and improving <clears throat> value chain production so that farmers benefit much more, and also the consumer is able to have healthy produce. In that way, we think and we are putting great emphasis in moving from trade to services to investment and industrialization. The first pillar by which we are negotiating and discussing with Europe now is not trade and commodities. We did a lot of that in sugar. We did very well or fairly well on the bananas, but we did the best in sugar in terms of the classical example of Mauritius that is even to retool its sugar industry, <coughs> that it has now a cane industry tied into a public-private partnership with a producer and an export and marketing in Europe, but also looking at the research so you can have biodegradable plastics from the trash of the cane. So when we say in the ACP we have this holistic value chain approach, it is because people have to be at the center. People who are producing and people who are receiving as the consumers. That is why the policy area is important. And that's where we play a part. We play a part in trying to look at what we call the governance. If there are not sufficiently incentivizing rules and regulations that will encourage the investors, why would they? But also, if they're not sufficiently incentivized regulations to see that the farmers get a better price, why should they be farming anymore? And young people are moving from the farming, and moving from the farming from the rural area to the urban areas, and then migrating. So we want this holistic picture to be conveyed. And if we are going to look at the governance, it means the decision-making must, in fact, be open, transparent. And the last point I want to mention at the start in understanding this systemic approach is that we must have accountability. We must have adequate reporting. And that's why we're very happy, the more recent uh, rural briefing that the CTA had, it looked at the blockchain to know how you can identify everywhere along the chain. So it's all well and good to say we have a new concept of value chain production. We must look at all of its components so that, in fact, the system works as a whole to benefit those who are producing and those who want to have the benefit of the produce. Thank you very much. Is it okay? okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gomes. Uh, you have set the scene you know, in terms of the approach of the value chain and the need to integrate policy to ensure that uh, we have uh, equitable uh, food systems, in the, especially in the ACP countries and the partnership that uh, the ACP is now uh, discussing with the, with the EU side. So that provides us a very good setting, I think, to continue our discussions. Uh, I would like to now... Uh, address uh, my question to Leonard. Uh, given, Leonard, your extensive experience in the private sector and, of course, since joining the Commission also, the great emphasis on leveraging uh, investment from the private sector, how do you see you know, the, the way to address you know, this challenge of uh, inequality and making uh, agri-food systems more inclusive you know, through investment uh, in the private sector? Thank you, and uh, thank you to Patrick Gomez. Uh, practically, we align, uh, I would say, 99.9% .9 on all what you said. And I just want to give a bit of nuances. And first of all, um, I thank CTA and the organizers for putting this high on the agenda. I think over the past two days, but also over the past years, um, we have started also valorizing more the role of agriculture and agribusiness. We can't risk agriculture and agribusiness falling down the cracks of the international agenda. We speak a lot about everything, but not often about agriculture and agribusiness. It might not be sexy enough to speak about agriculture, but I think this is at the core if we want to address inequalities, especially in the African continent. Mm -hmm. First of all, I give some headline figures. 10 billion people will live uh, um, in Africa by 2050. 
400 million just in Nigeria. So these are big figures. 100 plus million are in acute food crisis. It's not acceptable in today's world with all the digital, all the, all the wealth in, around the globe that 100 million plus are in acute food crisis. Many in the Sahel, but you have Yemen and a number of other countries. So this is, again, something which is not acceptable. Third, we need to create one million jobs in Africa per month. Now, when we go to speak to ministers, uh, we have reports, studies, analysis, and when you say, where are you going to create one million jobs per month, there aren't many clear answers. Agriculture and agribusiness is part, but you mentioned cashew nuts. Today, most cashew nuts are processed in Vietnam and in Asia. And yes, we need to decommoditize um, the coffees and the cocos, but that requires a holistic approach in terms of strategy. We don't have the governance across the UN agencies, the donor community, to come around the table and see what needs to be done to actually basically implement what we know should be implemented. Nothing is stopping in today's world to actually operationalize the studies, the analysis of what needs to be done to create jobs in Africa. You need clearly to have an industrialization strategy which has vision. Does this exist? Is it systemic? How is it fed within the continental free trade area? And there, Michael, what is the role of the private sector? Since I took over the unit uh, two years ago, it's clear that private sector is high on the agenda in terms of the impulse that the private sector can give to traditional ODA. And that is clearly the way forward. We are also signaling the private sector. But it was also clear from the external investment plan that the appetite to the risk agriculture is not there, or is not there sufficiently given the big financial gaps that are required to actually revolutionize what Patrick mentioned. Basically, we don't speak now more about agriculture. We speak about food systems. How do you revolutionize a food system which takes into account healthy diets, nutritious foods, and trade flows? Mm. And one of the solutions to reduce inequalities is to have intra-regional trade in Africa. We can't have an equal Africa if you have 54 separate markets with 15 to 20 percent maximum of intra-regional trade. So we need to have a strategy, and I know that there is an Africa strategy of 2063. I always say you can't wait until 2063. You need to really make that leap of progress, which requires you to increase your intra-regional trade. I just read an article a few weeks ago in the, in the Financial Times, which shows rice flows between West Africa, Benin, Nigeria, and Asia. The biggest importer of rice is Benin for rice entering Nigeria. So what signals do you want to give the rice processors in West Africa if you want to be self-sufficient? I, I enjoy hearing lots of ministers saying, I want to be self-sufficient in rice. I heard it 10 years ago. 2019, I want to be self-sufficient in rice. Everyone wants to be self-sufficient in rice. What is the cost of being self-sufficient in rice? And will there be a competitive edge for private sector to invest, for example, in rice? The question of cotton. It's important that the donor community, the UN agencies, and not only the Rome-based agencies, we are going to Rome tomorrow, and we have a major event to operationalize the Rural Africa Task Force. And we are going to show what Europe and European Union and the member states can do for Africa. Following up on the Rural Africa Task Force, having a territorial approach, using the experiences of rural development in European policy making, showing how to have sustainable land and resource management, also giving and pumping research in adaptation to climate change, having a transformation approach with European business 
which gives price transparency. I think even there we need to do more smart, um, smart investments for more equitable. And even in Europe, it took a lot of years. We spoke about unfair trading practices in the CAP and in the milk sector. We need to do this more in the cocoa and the coffee sector. We need to empower farmers' organizations, which we do. Hopefully, digital blockchain can enhance transparency also in terms of deforestation. But we are still not there. But let us show a sense of leadership, a sense of ownership, starting from Rome in the coming days, and building up a governance structure to show how things can actually be hastened, fastened, so that private sector will come and invest. Because today they will say, yes, Leonard, investment is important, but I don't have sufficient bankable projects. If you don't make them bankable, I can't invest. I go to all other sectors except agriculture. So we need to build up that framework conditions for bankability, and then investment will flow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonard. You have raised a lot of really key issues, you know, and, and I, th I think through your uh, intervention, you have shown the complexity, you know, in terms of addressing the, you know, the myriad challenges that we face in the agri-food system and the need for commitment from governments, from, you know, uh, donor agencies, international organizations, you know, coming together and supporting farmers and having the right, you know, policy environment uh, to make it easier for the private sector to engage. I mean, I think it's really revealing that the appetite for de-risking agriculture is not, even when there is resources available, is not where it's expected to be. So I, I think that you know, it says a lot uh, in, in uh, the challenges, you know, in terms of the challenges we face in this area. And of course, you know, the need to still keep uh, you know, highlighting that, you know, the, the, what's happening and what needs to happen in the agri-food sector. As you say, it may not be sexy as such, but you know, that's something that's really critical uh, especially for Africa as so, you know, the major uh, livelihood and uh, food security uh, 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 issue. Let me go to uh, Isabel, and uh, of course, right now you are at uh, ANCTAD, which does a lot of work supporting SMEs and uh, smallholder farmers and so on to engage uh, in, in agribusiness, in trade, and so on. So. Uh, what do you see as the kinds of investments and trade facilitation support that you know, SMEs and, and uh, farmers need to really be able to engage in the market, you know, to be able to... I think the big challenge is really to involve SMEs and, and, and smallholders in the value chain so that they can benefit from it. So what, what are the things you see and what's, what's ANCTA doing in that uh, respect? Oui, donc voilà, j'entends je, qu'il est dit que l'agriculture n'était pas Thank un you. sujet très well, sexy. Thank you. Well, of course, agriculture is not one of those very sexy subjects, but it is for me. And I think it really does deserve uh, our attention. We need to approach it differently now. We need a joint strategy between the European Union, among others, and uh, the 2063 pro projects and the African Free Trade Association. But we should take the right path. We need to understand how agriculture functions and how, therefore, we want to develop it. Family, small size agriculture and farming is what's uh, at stake here, depending on family labor. 50% of these small family farms are working in subsistence farming. They're not selling anything, they're just surviving. Only 3 to 5% of these family holdings have access or any kind of frequent or regular access to the market. And those that do sell are less than 2% of farms as a whole. So as you can see, most of um, agriculture in Africa, most farming is a subsistence farming. And that is going to get um, larger this amount because young people don't really want to take on family farms. They want to go to the urban areas. 
Si on se dit qu'on doit travailler à la croissance agricole, alors of course to contribute to the growth of agriculture. How can we do this? Well, I'm not sure really that the industrialized European model or the American model is the model that actually suits Africa. Massive industrialization of farming does bring with it a number of additional problems, and many of us are aware of that. So. You can see that uh, mechanized uh, machinery is causing havoc with the land and in tropical regions a lot of um, trees are being cut down and uh, land is lying, uh, is becoming desert and this really is not the key, this massive um, industrialized agriculture. Small farms are bigger or are better than, than big farms in Africa and that method works better um, for a family uh, farms. These small farmers only manage 12% of the overall farming areas, but they um, how produce 85% of foodstuffs throughout the world in terms of their value. So it's huge when you think about the uh, volume they have. But in Ghana, 90% of cocoa is on a few hectare holdings. And if you think that massive industrialization is the way forward, you're making a mistake. Of course, it's good to have access to markets and to trade, but perhaps not in the way that we've done in the previous century when the European Union or, the Amer or America had to make choices. We need to make different choices today, given also that we have climate change and all of us this has been imposed upon all of us. All of us need to take account of climate change also. Now, moving from subsistence farming to a farming that gives one access to the market, of course, it should um, depend on us here in the developed world. We uh, are working in the development sector, and we need to fight against the potential obstacles to farming, um, agricultural trading. So there's a problem of um, um, tariff um, barriers, and a lot of people are excluded because they don't meet the requirements of the European market in terms of tariffs, and we need to get rid of the obstacles for them. And also for other developing countries and developed countries and donor countries, um, there we all have our responsibilities. Now in Africa, they have to have a strategy that will integrate technology. This is a tool in today's world, particularly um, because many African farmers, most, would have a smartphone. This shouldn't just be used to send WhatsApp messages or to surf the net. It should be used also to try and identify where are their stocks, where are their surpluses, how can we work cooperatively uh, among the different farmers. And I think that the questions that the gov African governments need to ask themselves is how to accompany farmers, um, male and female farmers, how do we train them to um, correspond and make better use of their uh, merging technologies. How can we increase cooperation between farmers and cooperatives? Agroforestry is a fabulous instrument that allows um, land to become more profitable, um, taking account also of environmental challenges. And we also talk about value chains. If we're moving from subsistence farming to commercial farming, then regional and national value chains are extremely important. The local level will most easily respond to the demands of trade. We this is better than trying to join the major complex international markets. And small farmers can't really get a foot in the door there because the value chain is not fair for them. It privileges those who are at the head of the chain. And the smaller farmers do not benefit from all the different values throughout the chain. So we need to, they need to work more close to home more locally, and hopefully this will ensure better participation and better return on investment also. Now, the African Union has um, some key products 
rice, maize, cotton. No, cotton, let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, a group of four African countries, Benin, Mali, and a couple of others, four countries that have been trying for years now to change cotton subsidies, not allowing uh, the US and the UK to subsidize cotton, which impoverishes um, incomes for cotton producers in Africa. That's an instrument that's in our hands. Of course, it's the WTO, and uh, come back to that at every negotiation. We never seem to reach an agreement on this because in the WTO today is extremely difficult to find agreements on these issues which regulate um, abuses of power by some over others. So that is a big step for strategies for the future. Trade in bioproducts or organic products is today an expanding sector in developed countries, and it is beginning to take shape also in the developing world. And we've been working on biotrade. Biotrade has specific criteria and instruments that allow producers to work on this type of production. This type of production um, is attractive to many consumers, and in order to establish this, there is a specific set of criteria that allow producers to have access to the market. And uh, these are parts of the major strategies that need to be taken account of. We need to keep an eye on agriculture, particularly in the ACP countries. And how can we, in the face of climate change and its challenges, and in this world of industrialization for increased market Market access. How can we uh, move forwards to, to counter the problems we face today? On the one hand, we have poor farmers, including in the north and in the developed countries. And on the other hand, we also have uh, family um, famine and malnutrition amongst those families and farmers. And then on the other hand, we have obesity and people eating very badly which generate a huge number of health problems. So I think that uh, we need to look at the problem from different sides, and that's absolutely essential. And we will continue to be committed, working with African governments, the ACP governments, and also with producer cooperatives, and with everyone who allows these small and medium-sized enterprises and family farms to increase in sustainable ways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. I think um, you touched on really key issues in terms of the need to address, uh, you know, this complex issue, especially taking subsistence farmers, you know, farmers who have very limited resources, you know, to be able to integrate themselves into the value chains. They need to strengthen, I think, what they call short distance value chains or more local value chains so that, you know, smallholders can participate in that and the need for capacity building, and also the need to integrate technology so that one can do a lot more uh, in reaching out uh, and helping uh, SMEs and, and smallholder farmers to uh, be able to uh, access markets. So I think uh, these are very uh, key points, and I'm sure we'll come back to some of this also from the perspective of the global uh, WTO negotiations, how you can bring that policy support, uh, uh, taking into account you know, the needs of smallholder producers. So both from the local as well as from the global perspective, I think you have addressed uh, some of the key uh, important points. Thank you very much. So our next uh, speaker is Xi. Uh, Xi Yong, uh, you have been supporting, as we said earlier, uh, access to finance for SMEs, especially in Africa, so that they will be able to, you know, to trade uh, internationally. So uh, can you share with us, you know, some of uh, your findings? What are you seeing? You know, is this working? You know, uh, what's the prospect for this kind of approach in the future? Sure. Uh, thank you, Michael. I think, I mean, after hearing, I think the, the esteemed panel here over the last few rounds has actually embraced a lot of very good points about the need to coordinate between the, both the public and private sector's partners. 
But I think one thing that I'd like to highlight is also the wider community needs to understand from a foreign investor's perspective and how we look at, at investments in Africa. Because if you just take statistics-wise, there are a lot of other emerging markets and frontier economies around the world. But how come the penetration rate of foreign investments in this region is relatively weaker or poorer compared to the other frontier economies or emerging markets? And from my point of view, let me start with how the way I look at things. The key issues here in idea is also a lot of more idiosyncratic. What I mean by this is there seems to be a lack of trust between people who has money and people who need capital. People, a lot of people go into, into Africa, into this region with lots of hope, lots of impact, understanding and hopes to actually change the region, but they come in as an activist rather than a suggestionist, if you know where, if you know where I'm coming from. So what you have next is that a lot of investors like us have a point of view where they go in as a private equity fund or private credit fund. From day one, we already know they already have an exit horizon. And that cannot work in Africa. If you from day one knows that you're going to get out in five years' time, what you turn out is that you do not align your views and values with that of the entrepreneur. And so how we look at things from my perspective is over the last 10 years, we have been experimenting. And trust me, I mean, we have paid our school fees as well. But I think over the years, what we learn is we do a three-pronged approach in how the way we, we tackle it and how the way we add value to the agriculture supply chain in, in the region. One of the things that we do, the first approach, is actually we structure ourselves as not rather as a private equity or a private credit vehicle, but we structure it as a permanent capital vehicle. I think that is very key, and to all the foreign investors out there, one thing we see here is that we are not duration-bound. AKA means we're able to better align our values, able to sit down and partner with the entrepreneur, understanding his needs, and to understand local market peculiarities. More importantly, so we take this, what I call the risk-sharing approach, where we forge strong relationship with the governments, the, the private sectors, the local communities, so that everyone has a much more of a longer-term perspective. The thing that we focus on right now is what I call the missing middle. I think for us at TLG Capital as well, what we focus on is we tackle the missing middle. What do I mean by that is allow me to explain. Imagine a pyramid. The top tip of the pyramids are your larger corporates, which are pretty well served. And interestingly, the bottom of the pyramids are your micro-enterprises that actually the micro-financial institutions are catering to. But what we found out over the years is that it is the middle part of the pyramids that are what I call the missing middle. There is such minimal access to capital that over the last two years, with increasing global banking regulation, and top it up with countries like Nigeria, Ghana, where there's high sovereign rate of returns in just buying the sovereign T-bills, what you have is that local banks there, even though they receive cheap amount of fundings from local DFIs or larger you know, non-government organizations, giving them 3-4%, a huge amount of few hundred million facilities, but all these banking, banking local financial institutions, what they do, which is totally understandable, is that they take this funding and just invest in a 16% local Nigerian treasury bills. Why would they take the risk and on lending out to small, medium enterprises that requires it? So what we decided to focus on is this missing middle. And we decided to work in a structure, it's what I call a self-liquidating structure, where because we do not have a permanent, uh, we, do not, we are working as a permanent capital vehicle, we're able to structure structures that actually allows the company, the entrepreneurs, and the enterprises to actually grow along with it, while at the same time capping our risk in this way. The second, the third part that which you look at on is actually we focus on medium, small to medium-sized deals. 
I think what we see here is that debt is the sweet spot in here, and a lot of foreign investors fail to comprehend that. The reason why they see, if you can see from here, is that most of the organization starts to look at deals as above $50 million, $10 million even. And what you have is that you start to juxtapose yourself in infrastructure, extractive industries, oil and gas. And, but when you actually look at small to medium-sized deals, which we, where we see the sweet spot in, that is where we're able to better look at wider opportunities, particularly in the agriculture supply chain. So what we hear is that because we are better able to identify high-growth, mid-cap companies with very interesting business model that we are able to work with. But that being said, you know, one thing I'd like to highlight, and I think that this is what the, actually the panel has also recently highlighted, is that as foreign investors, what is our concern when we go into this continent? I think people need to understand that one of our foremost concerns is the, trans the predictability, transparency, and the reliability of the country's judicial system. We need to be comforted that there are policies in place that protect the interests of us foreign investors. That's one point here. And two, I think that structural reforms need to be put in place to ensure that there is a much more conducive environment for us to invest in. I mean, now what I see to take positive that there are certain countries, even like Uganda, Ethiopia, they're making adjustments to domestic policies to reduce cost and complexity in structural processes. There is also now liberalization, strategic liberalizations in some policies that allow foreign investors to come in and gain 100% ownership as well and to work with the local entrepreneurs. That is very important. And one thing that we see here is that I think intra-regional synergies is, I think, is full focus on. What we see here is that there are many countries and delegations that I meet from different countries within the continent come to me with, say, oh, Z, why don't you come and invest it? This is, the, this is the rebate I give you. This is attractiveness. But I think that there needs to be more harmonization and coordinations between different countries with relevant national policies to achieve more regional synergies, rather than competing for what I call foreign investments. This is one of the points I would want to, want to put across. So this is where I see that this is, like, this is extremely important. The next point, the last point I want to raise is the robust policy framework of infrastructure. I think that one thing that I think policies need to put in place is a robust policy framework that allows you, us to actually look at building the infrastructure, building education to foster employment. I think when you have all this in place and a stronger judicial system, that is when you actually begin to attract the foreign direct investments comes in. Because, I mean, if you want to talk to me about attractiveness of Africa, the attractiveness of agriculture supply chain, it's a common rhetoric. Because I can tell you now all the statistics and I tell you that there is a huge growth there. I mean, just put it in perspective, I usually go my, do my daily morning runs to the Starbucks to get a cup of Americano. It's about $2.50. And when you look at the $2.50, do you know how much is given to the just out of the $2.50? 10 pence of the $2.50, 10 cents, is attributed to the wholesale value of coffee beans. The retailers are the one that got the rest. And out of the 10 pence, the growers only really received one pence out of it. The rest of the eight pence, or eight cents in these terms, is actually given to the roasters. The roasters are like your like of your Nestle's. So what you see here is that there is a fundamental dislocation, but at the same time, it tells you that, that it's a necessity to improve and value add to this. I'd like to add here. Thank you very much, Ji. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. You have uh, highlighted, of course, the need you know, to have the uh, legal framework and, and uh, you know, all the, all the pieces in place so that governments encourage foreign investors to come in. So from what you say, you are seeing a lot of potential, even in the agricultural sector, which many investors are not attracted to. 
But I think the key is really to make sure that uh, investors have confidence and trust to be able to go into you know, specific African countries. Of course, with your last example, you have encapsulated the whole issue of inequality you know, between mm -hmm. the producers and uh, you know, others across the value chain. So it's also, I think, a real serious question to address you know, how to uh, rebalance you know, some of that uh, inequality that we see uh, along some of these value chains. Well, I know that we, have, we are being pressed a bit for time, so we'll be pushing on uh, and going to our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Moala Moto, uh, our young uh, innovator from Zambia. Uh, Moala, can you tell us, of course, uh, what we always hear is, you know, young people are not well supported, are not well encouraged, especially to go into the agribusiness sector. And you have obviously succeeded, you know, uh, establishing yourself and helping other young people uh, through your cashew business. So can you tell us, you know, what are some of the challenges that you faced, you know, as you try to develop your business and bring along, you know, other young people into the business? Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's very interesting to, as an African youth who's actively involved in agriculture to listen to all of you giving us all these figures and statistics about the development that has to be done in the agricultural sector. And you know, oftentimes as young people, when we sit among ourselves and we listen to our government officials, our politicians and policy makers giving these reports and uh, figures about the things that have to be done, we ask ourselves a question to say, what goes wrong because they speak so well when it comes to the reports, the figures, and the information. <laughs> but when we go on the ground, we are not seeing the actual work being done. Therefore, I want to come to this panel to give voice for the youth and the small-scale farmers in the developing world. I want to ask you a question, those of you that are in the congregation and are on the panel. Did you know that 60% of the African population is employed in agriculture, but yet the sector only contributes 15% to the continental GDP? In my country, Zambia, 70% of us are employed in agriculture, but we only contribute 15% to the national GDP. This is because there is very little economic activity that can be derived from the agricultural sector. But yet there are a lot of us that are involved in the agricultural sector on the continent. When I left my finance job with the British Council and decided to venture in farming, my family and, my family and friends thought I was crazy. They were asking me, agriculture is for old people. Agriculture is a dying industry. How can a young professional like you with a full ACCA qualification and an MBA decide to go into the agricultural sector? This is because there is very little development that you can attain from the agricultural sector. When you go on the ground, you realize that most rural African farmers are still using primitive agricultural methods, which are lowering their levels of production. When you go on the ground, you realize that farmers don't have access to a proper established market that can give them a profit for their products. This is not just international market, but even local markets. Some farmers are not connected. They don't have a road network to take their products to the urban areas. Therefore, we have got a lot of food wastage that takes place in the rural areas. When you go on the ground, ladies and gentlemen, you realize that the contribution to the agricultural sector is limited due to the poor value addition that is undertaken on the continent. 75% of the cash that is produced in Africa is exported to Vietnam and uh, in Asia. This is a processing facility that could employ a number of young people that are languishing on the streets. Some of these products that are exported in their raw form, are, in their raw form are exported at very cheap prices. That does not give economic value to the actual farmers. Therefore, there is need that more investment is supposed to be done in the agricultural sector. We cannot speak about sustainable development or equality if we don't address the agricultural sector, especially in Africa. Why? It's because the key players in the agricultural sector in Africa are women. These are the ones who go and water the vegetables in the fields. These are the ones who go and pick up the cashew nuts. These are the ones who are tilling the land for the maize. The key players are the young people. These are the ones who are employed in these farms. Therefore, if the agricultural sector remains in its stagnant form, we cannot address gender equality, even youth empowerment in our communities. Now, the question is, what is it that we can do to improve the agricultural sector on the African continent? The first thing that I want to speak about is the creation of industrial clusters. I think all the other speakers here have mentioned to say that most of the key players in the agricultural sector in Africa are small-scale farmers. And you realize that because these people are producing very little and they don't have enough resources to access better markets, 
most of the production is just limited within their farms and within the nearby areas. But if industrial clusters are formed, for example, those who are producing maize in this particular area, those who are producing millet in this particular area, those who are producing cashew in this particular area, they form an industrial clusters which can be linked with other developed markets or can be supported in terms of investment and capacity building. We are going to grow the agricultural sector on the continent. The second thing is value addition, brothers and sisters. We have to make sure that we should add more value to the things that are produced on the agricultural continent. I've already mentioned about the casual industry. This is a lucrative industry that can employ a number of people on the continent. But because the, the, the casual is exported in its raw form, there is very little economic activity that is generated from this particular industry. If they were processing plants in Ghana, if they were processing big processing plants in Ivory Coast, big processing plants in Tanzania, big processing plants in Mozambique, a number of young people would be employed in this sector, and you would realize that even when we are exporting the cash at the, as finished products, more economic value is going to be attained from the industry. Another thing that we need to consider is the effects of climate change and its impact on agriculture. If you will go on the agricultural con on, on, on the African continent, you realize that. Our agriculture most of the times is centered on one particular crop. For example, when you go to Zambia, the main crop that is grown by most of the farmers is maize. Why? It's because our staple food is shima or ugali, as the way they call it in other countries. So this is the only thing that they are producing. But the effects of climate change is reducing maize production. Why? Because maize need a lot of water. There is a specific temperature that is required for maize. Therefore, due to the effects of climate change, production levels in the maize industry in Zambia is going down. And currently, there is a food crisis. Why? Because we were focusing very much on maize. Therefore, there is need of diversification of products, taking into consideration climate change. The introduction of drought-resistant crops like millet, like sorghum, like cashew nuts, like cassava, all these are industries that require to be developed. We can also consider investing in agricultural technology and scientific research. We have got a good example of young people that are working in the agricultural sector, like Eze, who's running a company in Nigeria called Aerial Industries, where they are producing agricultural drones, which are assisting in revamping the agricultural sector to increase production, monitoring the things that are there. We can also invest in safe genetic modifications, for example, vegetative propagation for cashew trees. We should also diversify development in agriculture. I want to emphasize on this point because most of the time there is a lot of money that is allocated by international corporations to develop the agricultural sector. But you realize that, let me just summarize, you realize that because most of the times the money is channeled to government only, most of this money is just spent on what? On meetings, in the high-level meetings that they are discussing about policy frameworks. They are buying big vehicles. But yet the actual farmer on the ground is not benefiting on it. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, food is a basic need, and its continued scarcity is a threat to peace and security. We have to address the inequalities that are there in food production and distributing, or else there will come a time when the poor will have nothing to eat but the rich, and we are going to have a crisis. It's important that all of us work together to improve the agricultural sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, Moala, for your passionate uh, argument in favor of agriculture. No wonder you are the EDD uh, young leader, so I can see why you have been selected as a leader. <laughs> So well done. Uh, I think uh, the points you have raised are all pertinent, really, in terms of uh, the value addition. We have talked about that, especially you bring the issue of climate change and more challenges and more inequality being created by climate change. I think, uh, you know, and, and the need for research and innovation. I think that's something we haven't really brought up, but absolutely critical, you know, if we are going to make any headway in the agri-food system in Africa. So. Um, our next speaker is uh, Concepcion. Uh, her uh, company, uh, from the way I understand, you have several um, microfinance uh, institutions that you uh, have within your, your group, and you have been specially uh, addressing the needs of marginalized people, in particular women. So this would be really uh, quite a key area to see in terms of uh, access to finance, and we would be very happy to hear what are some of the things that you have been doing, what has been your experience, where do you see you know, the real need you know, in terms of scaling up <coughs> this work? 
So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the EDD organizers for hosting us today. Uh, and I would also like uh, for your kind presentation. And thanks, uh, everybody, for joining us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to share with you the experience of the BBVA Microfinance Foundation in promoting sustainable and inclusive development of vulnerable people in Latin America. The BBVA Microfinance Foundation uh, was created in 2007 within the corporate social responsibility framework of the Spanish financial group BBVA. The foundation operates through a group of six microfinance institutions in Colombia, Peru, Chile, Panama, and the Dominican Republic. Since it's, uh, ever since its establishment, it has uh, originated, as uh, we can see, uh, more than 11 billion uh, US dollars through microloans to more than 5 million low-income entrepreneurs. I would like to highlight some figures that uh, make clear the challenges we will face uh, in the near future. According to the World Bank, uh, more than 75% of the vulnerable people in uh, developing countries are currently living in rural areas, of whom 80% depend directly or indirectly on agricultural production as their main source of employment and income. Also, FAO uh, estimates that 60% uh, of these vulnerable people will continue to be rural in 2020. So, agricultural development is considered a key factor in achieving the eradication of poverty and hunger. Furthermore, at the moment of the around uh, um, 500, uh, 570 million farming operations on the planet, 90% are family-owned and over 72% are small scales. These family operations produce a large part of the world's food, but these families are also among the poorest and the hungriest in the world. So, these small-scale farmers and agricultural uh, operations are key catalysts for change, but they need financing mechanisms that are adapted to their activities, and they also need to be able to implement innovative uh, agri-sustainable business practices. Therefore, changes are, ne uh, changes are necessary to increase the productivity of these primary activities, to improve the capacity of these small-scale producers, farmers' producers, so that they can generate surpluses, gain access to new markets, and improve their incomes. Let me remind you that no country uh, has achieved a reduction, uh, a reduction of poverty without increasing the productivity of the primary sector. Our entities offer microfinance solutions uh, linked to our clients' productive activity uh, to increase uh, and to accelerate the rural financial inclusion. Through a diversified offer of greener products such as savings, microinsurance, accounts, and of course, microloans, our entity not only opens up access to more efficient technologies, but also contributes to the transformation of, of habits and behaviors targeted towards a more sustainable world. And now, let me share with you a very short video, a, a one-minute video, that shows our activities. Okay.
Well, you can see uh, our activity and also our clients. Uh, let me emphasize now that we collect data from all our clients on a recurrent basis that measure their progress. Through our impact measurement system, it is possible to, to ensure the fulfillment of our mission. Uh, you can check and download, if you want, uh, our social performance report from our website uh, to, to, to have more details. So we see how BBVA, how BBVA Microfinance Foundation is firmly committed to this sustainable development, and we will see how financial inclusion has an enormous potential to contribute to the inclusive transformation of the rural environment, and in doing so, taking an active part in achieving many of the 2030 Agenda's SDGs. And let me end by quoting uh, the General Secretary of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon. We are the first generation that can wipe out, out extreme poverty, and we are the last generation that can address the worst impacts of the climate change be before it's too late. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Concepcion, for uh, sharing you know, the, the important work you are doing, your organization is doing in supporting uh, marginalized groups to access finance. Uh, we work, City has been working with uh, your organization yeah. in uh, Dominican Republic, and yeah. we have had some very interesting results. We appreciate that partnership. Last but not least, uh, our next speaker is David Laborde. David is a uh, working with IFPRI uh, and uh, with IFPRI and, and CTA and uh, uh, GIZ, BMZ, uh, we have uh, a number of institutions coming together. We have been producing, the, we actually last year produced the first uh, African agricultural trade monitor, uh, which looked at the, you know, the evolution of trade, especially intra-regional trade in terms of uh, uh, you know, export, import, both re intra-regional as well as international trade, and this has been very highly appreciated by policymakers. You know, in terms of uh, giving them some baseline data of where the challenges are and so on. So David will be talking a bit about this uh, issue of inequality and what's the data that's showing, not just from the report but from some of uh, IFPRI's work. Uh, in, in the agri-food sector, you know, and, and also as it relates to trade. And he will also try to draw some lessons for the future reports that we might want to uh, look into this uh, issue. David. Merci. Um, donc pour... Thank you. I'll try to be brief, given the quantity of information that's already been um, mentioned this afternoon. So through CTA and with the support of the German agency, we have produced this report on market access in Africa and also on Africa's position in the world and its regional integration. I'm not going to go into the details of the report. I'd like to focus on inequality and the link between um, the agriculture uh, between agriculture and inequality what's important in this report um, is that the world is changing you can't keep the same ideas in your head as you had 20 years ago about what um, Africa is previously Brazil Argentina sorry and Russia. Brazil, Argentina and Russia were the uh, main suppliers of agricultural produce and obviously the EU countries would be um, on that list too. But you know this, this idea of a world where North and South are very polarized is no longer true. We need to put, um, we need to uh, make sure that we're more up to date. Now, I talked about a link between inequality and trade. If you follow the news, you'll know that trade is a very thorny and sensitive issue. This is an issue in developed countries and developing countries, and globalization isn't perhaps the most popular concept. Integration of markets um, ha and competition has created winners and losers. And what we want to do is redistribute wealth in society so that we respect the social contract. In Africa, 
and given in particular the strong regional integration with the uh, African continent free trade area, we need to have an active policy to avoid um, us taking a step backwards. Otherwise, we're going to have the same tensions as we've seen in Europe, and some countries won't be satisfied. Perhaps I could t um, mention an analytical point when we're talking about inequalities in trade. When I say there's inequality between countries, um, we need to be aware that the African continent is very diverse with some very advanced economies and um, some um, uh, like South Africa. And there are other countries which are still at a lower level, for example, the Central African Republic. Integrating those economies which are so different is a major challenge. They're as different from each other as the United Kingdom and Greece. This is not easy. It can bring enormous gains, but we do need active policies. We're going to see inequalities within countries too, so between agriculture and services, say, and within agriculture, between different value chains, between livestock breeders and cereal growers, for example. And we know that there's an ethnic dimension too in some countries, which, uh, and sometimes the winners and losers um, are divided along ethnic lines. There are political consequences too. Similarly, there are territorial inequalities. And when we're talking about inequalities, uh, land is very important because you can't move land. You can move water a bit, but you can't move land. And when we ask why young people are leaving agriculture and the rural world, it's not because farming isn't an attractive job. It's because you don't have services in rural areas that you have in cities and young people want access to those services. So managing inequality from that point of view is very important. And then inequality related to trade, you're going to find that within households too, between men and women too, because in agricultural um, households you have specialization in different tasks. For example, the men might look after the livestock and the women might have different tasks. So you can accentuate those inequalities or you can try to remove them. Now, farming in itself is not going to miraculously reduce inequality. It really does depend on the context in which we're working. It depends on the country and it depends on the different conditions. But uh, trade can be a catalyst and it can accelerate progress. Change applies, uh, arrives more quickly thanks to trade. Uh, progress ar arrives more quickly thanks to trade. My last point on um, inequalities and trade. The reduction of inequalities can change how you trade and what you trade. So depending on demand, and this is something that we're seeing already, in many African countries we're reducing inequalities and we're seeing the emergence of a middle class. Middle classes have new tastes and new purchasing powers and this can enable um, national, local or international companies to respond to that demand. The fact that there might be more imports into Africa isn't a problem in itself. The idea of food security um, or food sufficiency it, um, isn't necessarily important in itself. We've talked about rice, but in West Africa you have 15 countries which might say, well, we're going to be self-sufficient in rice, but if you're going to have trade, you need imports and exports. If you just export, then that doesn't make sense from a trade point of view. We need to bear that in mind. The emergence of a middle class this is what one of the previous speakers said, and I think it's an important point. Both from the point of view of consumers and producers, the emergence of the middle class and the middle man is going to be vital for um, the way society develops. We have some good examples. Um, we've heard those around the table. Not Everyone is destined to be a farmer. Just because you've been uh, born a farmer doesn't mean that you're going to be a good farmer. 
I would have been a very bad farmer. We need to create jobs in other sectors so that people can move around. But the idea that you might have talented entrepreneurs who then regard agriculture as a commercial activity and would therefore need um, credit to be able to develop the, um, the farm um, is important. To conclude, then, when it comes to solutions and policies, um, and all of this is in the report, one thing is uh, very striking when we look at Africa. Costs uh, for transport and costs for market access are very high, including for the informal economy. Let me give you an example. You're transporting goods between Bergen and Seville, which is equivalent to Casablanca to Lagos. Now, Casablanca, Lagos, it'll cost you three times more to move the goods, um, and you will have lots of controls as well. If you're a small producer, then you can't afford it. You won't have the necessary legal protection either to do that. So there are formal and informal barriers to moving goods around, and that excludes small producers from the possibilities of trading their goods. To conclude, now, you might say that trade can cause inequalities, but actually, it's something great. This is one of the um, activities that distinguishes us from the other, uh, from other species of animal. Um, cooking is another one. But to trade, you need confidence. You need a state which provides a framework within which the market can work to build confidence, to certify the produce. And of course, we have new technologies now which help us to um, be more effective in, the agricul in agriculture, for example, drones and blockchains. In Africa, for example, in Senegal with onions or in Ethiopia, consumers need to have confidence about the kind of the bag of produce that they're buying. They need to have confidence that the onions are high quality or that the wheat is high quality. So we need a framework which provides that basic information. In most countries, that would be something that already exists. But it's a real opportunity for Africa um, to be able to put that in place and enable farmers to trade. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for uh, you know, highlighting the differences exist not, not just across countries and regions, but even within countries and households and the complexity of the you know, trade issues and trade could be could reduce inequality if we manage it uh, properly. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time and I'm g getting signs that we have to move quickly because I think they're going to have the closing session after our session. So I could probably take maybe one or two burning questions from the audience and I will ask the uh, uh, speakers to, to be very brief. Uh, Max from GIZ. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Max Baumann from uh, GIZ. I just would like to emphasize a point I was missing when we talk about supporting and fostering regional, intra-regional trade in Africa. This has to come hand in hand with a strong commitment for food safety. Uh, and I don't mean food safety in terms of exporting to European markets, but food safety for intra-regional cross-border trade in Africa, because this can be a first step to develop improved standards, especially also for uh, local and smaller producers. And there, my question would be maybe also to Isabel and Dr. Gomez, how do you see uh, the role of the regional economic bodies, CADEP, I mean, we have this new indicator on food safety in Kadeb, but how this can become implemented, I think it's a, a crucial question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I have the lady over there? The lady, just right there. Thank you. I'm Alain Asimwe from Credmark East Africa. We support uh, countries and organizations to trade by easing the cost of doing business. It's a very interesting topic, the nexus between agriculture and trade, and one of the issues we've been struggling with. Because like uh, Mila said, it's like a bottomless pit. You invest so much, you don't see much coming out. 
But one of the things that we really need to see is how to shift the balance of power back to the farmers. And again, Isabella mentioned it, the whole issue of aggregation, consolidation, from the one-acre farms and small holdings that we have, to seeing how we can consolidate and get our farmers to actually start trading. But if they trade on their own, they're not going to make a difference. But our cooperatives, unfortunately, have been decimated. So how do we go back to balancing and shifting the power back to the farmers through all those cooperatives that enable them to negotiate better, have better opportunities to source? So we are looking at cross-border markets, we are looking at logistics, but there's a lot more needed to shift the balance of power, especially when it comes to value addition. A lot more is needed. Thank you. I'll take one last question. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Oh. Uh, Moderator, Director uh, Hailu. Uh, Mr. Baruti, I'm a senior research fellow within Research et Documentation Juridique Africaine. And indeed, we in our organization, we are trying to deal with uh, different judicial system as the speakers close to Madame Isabel uh, raised it uh, up. But we should also uh, recognize that after the the independence, there were some investment uh, agreement between the old colon, uh, uh, country and the new uh, uh, country uh, colony, from colony. The agreement was for the fourth maxim, minimum 90, 90 years. So the, those kind of agreements are, continue, are all going and continue to be applied, and it's not easy to change the judicial system if we don't negotiate with the old colony. And I will finish with the uh, issue of cooperation between the region. In Africa, it's possible, but if we scan, scan through the relationship between African countries, we see that many neighbor countries are in conflict. So we should first finish uh, the issue of conflict between countries be uh, before to think about cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll just uh, uh, limit to those two questions, and uh, Isabel and uh, Dr. Gomes, can you have a quick response? Yes, very, very rapid response about food safety. Um, yesterday, we had a uh, workshop on uh, geographical indication. And the geographic indications are one way that we can guarantee the quality of products, but also to what extent they uh, represent uh, an economic value and are identified with a specific area, not just gastronomic quality but uh, value, but also um, commercial value. And this is one way of guaranteeing the quality of the foodstuffs, which will help um, non-tariff barriers to be collapsed. So working on quality is extremely important in terms of exports at regional level and international level. And I just wanted to come in on what the woman down here said, cooperation, um, producer groups. Um, of course, this makes them stronger, allows them to negotiate prices, allows them to work s um, seriously and to avoid dispersion and that is extremely important and absolutely the best way and we're looking for government policies that can encourage and subsidies give subsidies and support and even if those uh, political actors are not in agreement with the policies of the government. Sometimes we don't want to subsidize systems that we disagree with. But those are the rules of the game. If we are wanting to encourage producers to come together and to have a greater weight and force. And the third issue is confidence, trust, and the problems with the, the, those who previously were the colonizers. That's a difficult, tricky issue. When we're trying to construct a, a big market or an African free trade zone, that is going to take time. We need political agreement and we need to ensure that we do everything we can. There will be losers, absolutely. It's not going to be a magic solution for all our problems. This is an agreement, however, which is in everyone's interest, but there will be losers. And my organization will also risk 
incurring losses to encourage other people to negotiate intelligently in their own national interests so that the global market will not be the overall loser. Otherwise, it's never going to work. There are problems, of course. I was listening to a program today on Albania wanting to join the European Union. Oh, my goodness, those discussions. I'm not sure everybody's very enthusiastic about that prospect. But we are trying to bring in countries that are at a completely different level of cooperation, that have different interests. We want to ensure they don't get left behind, but we don't want those who bring everyone else down. It's going to be a very long path, but there are policies we can implement to accompany them. Uh, I'm, just briefly. No, I'm clearly what Mal has said and the lady's question, shifting the balance of power is fundamental shifting the balance of power, and therefore organizing. What I think in many of these instances, we do not put on the table what has been successful, what is accomplishing some specific goals. And that's where I think uh, a contribution of Mala is so critical that you say where the clusters have worked, what have been their, their benefit and value, and how you can expand that. So there will be a multiply effect. And that's why I think I like Leonard's point, the coordination among the international organizations so fundamental. Maybe we're tripping over each other. We all know the same thing. I have to regret, regretfully said, these same comments were made 40 years ago when I first went to my conference on agriculture economics in the Caribbean. Now we're speaking about the Thank same you. things at the same time. Are we not putting what has been successful so it can have a multiply effect? The family farming system, yeah. where there's been coordination, how you link the research, and if freeze work. So I think some more of that is much more case study, the clinical uh, yeah. analysis and consequences so that we can model it and move forward. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank you very much. I'm getting warning from the <laughs> organizers. Well, as you can see, this is a very lively debate. We could have continued for some time and uh, given the other speakers uh, opportunity to also answer some of the questions. But unfortunately, we are running out of time. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers for their excellent contributions and also to thank you all uh, for uh, joining us at this session. Thank you very much.